Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. On behalf of Goodwin University's Office of Student Affairs and Goodwin University's Occupational Therapy Assisting Program, I'd like to offer you a warm welcome to our second annual Achieving Success and Navigating Career Obstacles with a Disability Program. My name is Stephanie Herbst. I am the Assistant Director of Career Services here at Goodwin. This is my colleague, Marty Levine, fellow career specialist at Goodwin. And we are going to serve as like your flight attendants or your guides for the day. So some of you may know that we kicked off 2020 with an exciting announcement. As of January 6th, Goodwin College officially became Goodwin University. Yay! This change is very exciting for a number of reasons. In particular, it advances our mission to make a quality, career-focused education more accessible to a greater number of individuals. It also offers new opportunities for focused research that supports access to education, workforce development, and advocacy for important community issues. And one of those issues and opportunities comes in the form of this program today. We hope that through today we are able to look at the intersection of career development and disability services and resources and how we can ultimately better support our students and our peers in the community who have disabilities, ultimately to empower our Connecticut workforce to be as diverse and as strong as possible. So we're hoping that today we accomplish a few goals, one of which is to gain knowledge and awareness of challenges and successes faced by individuals with a disability when navigating employment, we hope that there's an opportunity for you to network among yourselves with colleagues and peers, both in human resources and disability support services arenas. And of course, we hope that you'll walk away today and gain resources for achieving success with a disability. So I just want to offer a, a few quick thank yous. I want to offer a big thank you again to the Office of Student Affairs with a specific nod to accessibility services led by Cindy Clark. You can wave your hand. Also to Veterans Affairs, led by Craig Jordan. And as I mentioned, to Career Services, led by Director Pat Shaw. And all of this is under the leadership of Dr. Tyrone Black, who is our Vice President for <coughs> Student Affairs and Dean of Students, who will be joining us this morning as well. In addition, as I mentioned, I want to thank the Occupational Therapy Assisting Program, which is led by Program Director Parth Desai. Um, today, the OTA program is represented by former Program Director and Instructor Deanne Anderson, who actually will be moderating a large part of today's program. And Kathy Kravanek, I think Kathy's back here, who's our field work coordinator. Thank you all. Thank you, with a specific thank you to Deanne Anderson and her organization, Creative Development, from Avon, Connecticut, for sponsoring our breakfast this morning. Please uh, extend a thank you to your whole team at Creative Development. It was, it was delicious, of course, help yourselves throughout the morning. Just a couple quick housekeeping items. So I hope you notice the bathrooms are right outside here to your right and left. There are different exits. There's a, a more accessible exit and entrance right behind you in the back where it says the exit sign. And there's a resource table I hope you all noticed when you walked in. You're welcome to take any of the resources. We have great guides on disability resources. Or if you brought your own representing your organization, feel free to leave those there. And hopefully you also have a chance to look through your packets. You can follow along with the PowerPoint today. 
We have um, information about our panelists that's also at the resource table. And you'll see there are index cards at your table. If at any point in the morning you want to ask a question but prefer to keep the question anonymous, just fill out the, one of those index cards, raise your hand. We have a few volunteers who are going to be walking around. We can collect those questions so that we make sure to ask the moderator. Okay, I'm going to pass the baton over to my co-flight attendant here, Mr. Marty Levine, to kick off the agenda. Thanks, all. Okay, we have several different... Uh, I don't need time. Yeah, it's for the video. Oh, your video? Yeah, we got it. Okay. okay. Um, we have several different modes of learning for everybody here, for learning, discussion, asking questions, and one of those modes is, for, of course, our keynote address. Uh, we're right on time. We're on time now. We'll make sure we stay on time. We'll have our panel discussion, and you have these um, uh, information sheets in your folders. Uh, we'll make sure we take a 10 or 15 minute break. Then we're going to have a discussion with our uh, uh, students from Project Search and, and their director. Uh, then we're going to go into case studies, and this will give you an opportunity to really take what you may be getting from our panelists, as well as what you, all, what you also bring, and, and review these somewhat in-depth case studies and have discussions uh, with your colleagues at your tables. That's the real stories discussion. Uh, and then as we move towards the end, there's always opportunities for Q&A, and we'll talk about the morning. And then uh, we'll finish up before or by 12 noon, and we'll ask you to complete a uh, survey electronically, QR, or hard copy uh, that we could give to you as well. Let's see. Okay. Um, at this point, um, I'd like to introduce Todd Andrews, who knows uh, our keynote speaker, John Slifka. Todd is our senior vice president. Uh, for economic and strategic uh, development here at Goodwin University. Todd. Thank you. Thank you. Stephanie, does Todd need this? No. Good morning. Welcome to Goodwin University. Sorry. Do you have to hook me up? Yes, please. Okay. Thank Stand you. by for technical <laughs> difficulties. No problem. I have the distinct pleasure and honor to introduce this morning's keynote speaker, Jonathan Slifka. Presently serving as the executive assistant to the commissioner of the Department of Aging and Disability Services for the state of Connecticut, John has had a very successful career rooted in advocacy for those with disabilities. He previously served for four years as Governor Malloy's liaison to the disability community, during which time he was instrumental in policy making and government, government affairs at the cabinet level. Major accomplishments throughout his tenure include developing and passing multiple pieces of legislation, including a bill that changed the international symbol of access in Connecticut to one that more accurately represents the dynamic capabilities of disabled <laughs> individuals. He also reformed and restructured the Governor's Committee on Employment and Persons with Disabilities, and he developed and created events and programs for the annual National Disability Employment Awareness Month. Before moving on to work for the Governor, John actually worked here at Goodwin College. At the time, it was Goodwin College. Uh, he was part of our admissions team, and with his good friend Eric Emmett, who is joining us today, he was also involved in the development of Goodwin College's club sports program, and I think ran one of our first Goodwin blogs um, and podcasts, I believe. John uses his personal understanding of the challenges faced by the disability community to strengthen and inform his commitment to the work with which he is tasked on a daily basis. He is a founding member of the Board of Directors for the Miracle League um, of Connecticut, whose mission is every child deserves a chance to play. The Miracle League provides opportunities for children with physical and cognitive challenges to participate in baseball leagues at the Miracle League field in West Hartford, 
which is fully wheel wheelchair accessible and was the first of its kind in New England. And I believe I saw on social media last night that there's another Mir Miracle League field that's going to be built in East Line. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. East Line. So uh, that program continues to expand. But as mentioned, personally, I have known John and his wonderful family for well over 30 years. Joining him today is his wife, Andrea, his beautiful daughter, Lauren, and his mom and dad, Janice and Bob Slifka. So I'd like to give a shout out and wave to those in the back of the room. I first met John when he was just a youngster. John always had to advocate for himself, particularly when it came to the lack of opportunities as someone with a physical disability. When his older brother, Scott, was off enjoying summer youth basketball camps, John had limited opportunities. There were no basketball or recreational camps for those who were limited by physical disability and perhaps bound to a wheelchair. But he and his mom, Janice, went off and created something special. With the help of Hall of Fame tennis player, Ivan Lendl, almost 30 years ago, the adaptive sports camp was created the very first wheelchair camp of its kind in the Northeast. Today, the camp is run by the Hospital for Special Care on the campus of the University of St. Joseph. The week-long free summer camp allows dozens of children aged 6 to 19 to enjoy all kinds of sports, including tennis, swimming, basketball, track and field, and many other sports. Many of the counselors are wheelchair athletes themselves and serve as mentors and coaches to the campers. Hundreds of individuals have enjoyed this camp over the last 30 years. So I congratulate certainly Janice and all those uh, who are involved with John in having this program continue to run. And I believe uh, this year or next, it's gonna be their 30th anniversary. So congratulations on that. John has been involved from the beginning and is still very active today, although today his job responsibilities in raising his own family may get in the way of being a camp counselor, which he did for many decades, but he still serves as a role model and mentor to the campus and his campers and is still very active uh, in visiting the camp every year. But it all started with the inspiration of one individual. One individual who found a way to navigate some obstacles with a disability in order to achieve success. One individual who has taken his success and shared it with others. One individual who continues to advocate on behalf of those faced with similar challenges in order for them to be successful. John, welcome back to campus. I have the honor and pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker for the day, Jonathan Slitka. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Andrews for that uh, incredible introduction. Um, it's, uh, it's so nice that all the information that he shared has the added benefit of all being true. <clears throat> or I'd owe him a lot more money than I do right now for, for the introduction that he just gave me. Um, thank you all very much for being here. Thank you to Goodwin University for uh, inviting me to be a part of this this morning. It's a pleasure. So I'd like to start this morning by making you perhaps a little bit uncomfortable, but um, this is something that the disability community deals with on a daily basis. Um, so in all seriousness, by a show of hands, how many of you have ever heard someone say, or maybe said yourself, and that's okay because we're here to learn, that person is so inspiring when referring to people with a disability? It's common, and it's generally very well-intentioned. Okay, to someone who is able-bodied, 
they can't imagine having to live daily life with the added challenges of a disability. And so people who are able to do just that and not only live each day but succeed, that's impressive. The fact is, though, people with a disability don't want to be inspiring because they succeed with a disability. They want to be inspiring for the same reasons everyone does. Because they succeed at something that brings them joy each day. <coughs> Watching someone live with joy, to me, is an ultimate inspiration, and it's something that every person, regardless of ability, should be able to do. So if you're a person with a disability looking for work, or someone who's helping a person with disabilities find work, the focus should always be on the ability and their passion. So in the job search, what, what are the kinds of things that we look for? And what are the kinds of things that, as people that are going to help people with disabilities look for a job, what kinds of things should you, you look for? And as the candidate, what should you look for? What abilities does this person have, right? What skills have they gained through other experiences? All of those things. That's the first thing. In what ways do they think they can make a meaningful contribution to whatever job, organization, company that they're going to work for? And what can they bring to a role that is unique? So if I were to ask you, and I'm not going to make anybody, I'm not going to call anybody out, but if I were to ask you to give me three words to describe what you bring to the workforce that no one else does, could you do it? Yes. Okay. That's impressive. It's actually not all that easy to articulate what it is that makes you stand out from someone else when looking solely at your unique capabilities and perspective. And I'm not talking about I make better coffee than everyone else on my floor. I'm talking about I'm the most efficient, I'm the most creative or the most forward-thinking person at whatever the job might be, project management, copywriting, or at a college, university, admissions, things of, things of that nature. So we need to own these things about ourselves, and then we need to look for these things in others, and we need to focus on these skills when we're navigating in any job search. But it's particularly important for persons with disabilities. So for just a moment, I'd like to entertain a case study. So here's a candidate looking for a job. 13 years experience as a call center representative working on customer support systems and platforms and in sales. Previous roles include quality assurance representative for Precision Response Corporation and a personal vacation planner for Carnival Cruise Lines. And they subsequently worked in enrollment and admissions for college. So if you were going to look for a job for this person, What roles do you think that they might be qualified to take on next? And why would you think that? Not all at once. I know some of you haven't had your coffee yet. Yeah. Well, anything to do with interacting with people because all of those positions were, they were able to have good communication or interaction skills. Okay. So any, any job that involved interacting with people because they, they exhibit communication skills throughout these jobs. Mm -hmm. Career Okay. There's no wrong answer, by the way, to this. So. An office manager because of the organizational and communication concept related okay. to that. An office manager? Anything else? Whatever they felt like they wanted yeah. to do next. <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah, <that's good. laughs> it's nice to have you at the table, Mr. Right <laughs> Murphy. <laughs> Whatever this person wanted to do next. Okay, so what if I told you that that's not a fictional person? What if I told you that that person's next role, their next job, was the governor's liaison to the disability community for the state of Connecticut? Okay, that's me. And I'm not sharing this with you to toot my own horn or do that. I'm showing this to you because it's the real life example of someone that can go from jobs like these to a job working in government. Now, obviously, having a strong understanding of life as a member of the disability community was helpful in me attaining my first role in government, as was my notoriety and involvement in local politics. And I also was a March of Dimes poster child 
in my youth. But my particular course is not typical, and I understand that, but I'm grateful that when an opportunity was available, the people who needed to make the decision to employ me focused on the skills and abilities that I attained in my previous roles above what specifically those previous roles were or where I held them. So let's look at some of the skills because some of them were mentioned here this morning. Let's look at the, some of the skills that are cultivated in jobs like those and that prepared me for a role in the governor's office. So the ability to engage individuals and process feedback to improve experience and processes. So again, that involves dealing with people. So very high level, sort of generic, you know, broad looking view at a skill, but also a creative way to look at a skill and ability that was attained. And that's a way you need to approach look, looking, at, uh, looking at people with disabilities when they're looking, looking for a job. Be able, to identify, be able to identify solutions to problems and present them clearly to stakeholders. Again, that's high level, it's generic, but that's a person with a disability. When I was showing you the last slide, by the way, that showed you what these other jobs were that this person had had, was there any indication whatsoever that that person had a disability? No. Exactly. So keep that in mind when you're looking at a person's resume and helping them try to find a job. Okay. Able to lead others towards progress on a common goal. Again, high level, a little bit, a little bit gener generic, but it gets you in the mind of a creative thinking process and how you can help somebody navigate obstacles. And able to manage projects and gain expertise in required areas. Okay. So these skills combined with my personal experience allowed me to take on my first government role in which I took part in identifying needs in the disability community and not only forming the right groups of people to address those needs, but also actually was part of the policy making process. So what was one major thing, and, and, and I hope this is brought up uh, more often throughout the morning, but there's one major thing that I was afforded that was critical to my success. And I will throw it out to the room to take a guess, and if anyone gets it, I will be, I will be shocked. <coughs> Any guesses? Support from your wife. Support from my wife. Thank you. I'll, Yes, I def definitely had support from my wife every step of the way. Mm. Dignity of risk. Does anybody know what that is? Taking a chance on you. So I'll read it for you. But it's the idea that self-determination and the right to take reasonable risks are essential for dignity and self-esteem and so should not be impeded by excessively cautious caregivers concerned about their duty of care. So I attended an event similar to this about three or four years ago, and there was a, um, a, a headhunter that was a recruiter that was helping people with disabilities find jobs, and they told this story. Okay. They found somebody a job that was completely in their wheelhouse, something that they wanted to be doing, they were excited about it, and about three or four days into their first week, they got a call from this person's boss, and they said, you know, I don't think this job's going to work out for them. And she said, why? What happened? She said, well, they show up every, late, they, they show up every day late. They are, um, they're flustered when they get here, and, and, and it's affecting their attitude, and it's just, it may not be a good fit. And she said, well, this doesn't sound like the candidate that I put in front of you, so let me, let me, let me dig a little deeper. So she, would, she got in touch with the candidate. And it turned out that the issue was that the, that the employee had an issue navigating the public transit system. Now, we've never heard of that issue in the state of Connecticut <laughs> with, for people with disabilities and potentially anyone else in the room. So it wasn't the job. It was getting to the job. Okay? So when you think of, the, when you think of dignity of risk and you think of helping people with disabilities find a job, Think of it in the following ways, and ask yourself these questions. A, have you ever had a dream? B, have you ever attempted that dream? And C, have you ever failed? Every single one of you in this room should be raising your hand at those questions. And if you can't, then you shouldn't be helping people with disabilities find a job, because those are the, those are the exact same things that they should be afforded. They should be afforded a dream, they should be afforded a shot at a dream, and they should be allowed to fail. Don't be afraid of that. 
Okay. So I was given the opportunity to fail. People with disabilities should be given the opportunity to fail just as everyone else is. Now it can be incredibly helpful in the career search process for a person with disabilities if the people they're working with in that process help vet them and identify positions that are most attainable in which they might be most successful, successful to minimize the risk of failure. That's helpful both for the individual and the employer, but it's critical not to undervalue or under, underestimate the person in that process. And that's what happened in the story that I shared with you early, earlier. The person was undervalued. Okay, we want people with disabilities to be realistic about what they can achieve, but also we want them to be able to pursue that joy that will inspire them and others every day. So when it comes to, to all of these things, dignity, risk, and such, I've always looked at the movable and immovable. So what are movable, movable objects or movable, movable obstacles I was able to get around in my career? Accessibility issues, articulation of my skill set, and the attitude of others. So let's, let's take these one at a time. Accommodations can, and as we all know, should be made to, workplaces, to make workplaces functional for a person with disabilities. And accommodations can run the gamut from no to low cost to certainly higher end cost. Okay. I worked hard over the years on my interview skills and how I explained the way I'd be able to apply the skills I learned in one work environment, like Carnival Cruise Lines, to a very different work environment, like the Capitol. And also, want, never underestimate the fact that the attitude of others can be swayed if you persevere. Just like any, any candidate for a job, we need to believe in ourselves and sell ourselves. Also, I've never been afraid to work the connections that I have, and you shouldn't either when working with this community. That's why social, pla social network platforms like LinkedIn are incredibly powerful and incredibly successful. Okay. So now let's move on to the immovable objects, or uh, barriers rather. Physical limitations, cognitive job requirements, attitude of others. For those of you who have had your coffee, yes, I have that on there twice. <laughs> We're all probably familiar with the things that are immovable for someone with disabil disabilities navigating their career search. Some jobs will require physical or cognitive skills that are simply not a match for the job seeker. And unfortunately, some employers may, despite our best efforts, not be able to see a qualified person's skill set if previous experience doesn't exactly match the relevant work experience required in a job description. That's likely true for any candidate, but as a person with a disability, I can tell you I had a few extra rungs in the ladder to climb as a result of this. But the ultimate goal at the end here be passion focused. This is the bottom line. My career track is circuitous, to be certain. In the last few years, I worked as an equal opportunity employment specialist for the state, and today I serve as an executive assistant to the, com to the commissioner of uh, the Department of Aging and Disability Services. I chair the governor's committee on employment for persons with disabilities and focus on the issue of helping qualified people find gainful employment every day. I can't say that throughout my career I was happy where I was every step of the way, but who can? Ever since I've been in government, there were times I wasn't certain where I was, where I was working was the right fit. I can absolutely say that I learned something with each new experience along my career path, and I took to heart the criticisms that I received that were valid and dismissed the ones that weren't. I worked hard not to allow my disability to get in the way of what I wanted, and I put effort into developing my own personal narrative. I let my disability inform the work that I do as much as necessary, but it has never defined me. We should all consider ourselves to be defined by our intellect, our insightfulness, and what we contribute to the workplace and the world. All any of us can do is our best and determine how, when called upon, we'll tell our own story. The world has changed, but not as much as you might think. When I was going to school, I was one of the first children with a disability mainstreamed through the public school system in my hometown, and the ADA did not exist. My first few years, I went to a school that was not handicapped accessible at all, and I had to be carried around by older students from one place to another. During my time there, I didn't have a wheelchair yet, so during recess, the only way the school would allow me to participate was by bringing my desk chair outside and have me sit in it watching the other kids play. I vividly remember getting out of the chair once 
to sit on the ground and play with matchbox cars with a classmate. And I got in trouble for it. That was a very isolating experience. I didn't attend a school with an elevator until I was in fifth grade. In high school, I transferred from a one-building public school to an open campus private school after my sophomore year. As luck would have it, it seemed like during my first two years of high school, in the one-building school, we hardly got any snow during the winter. When I switched to the open campus, that winter we were hit by a blizzard. Fast forward to my first day working at the Capitol in 2014. The elevator to my office was broken. Here I am the liaison to the disability community, and I can't get to my desk. All I could think was, thank God I'm here. <laughs> but truly, as a working person in this society that continues to take baby steps each day to being more accessible, more understanding, and more inclusive of those with disabilities, the best knowledge I can part, impart on you is that a focus must be put on people's passions. If we can match up people who have something to give with those who are ready to receive it, we will make a difference every day. You will make a difference every day. There will be rejection. There will be times when we need to acknowledge our limitations. There will also be times when we are able to translate skills into a role we may not have imagined would be a good fit, both as the employer and the employee, and something incredible will result. There will be great joy in that, and that is the ultimate goal. I encourage everyone to look for those opportunities. It's been a pleasure this morning. Thanks very much, everyone. Any questions? Sure, of course. Any uh, questions uh, for John at this point? Mm -hmm. I'm on technical about comedy. Sure. So if I heard if I heard you correctly, mm -hmm. um, any employer should be able to give accommodations if necessary, right? It should be required to, yes. Should be required <laughs> to correct. That's what the law So says. during the interview, does the prospective employee tell them that they require accommodation? That's actually uh, a good question. It, we're, oh, I'm sorry. No, yes, no, I think no, you please. should answer that related, but we also will be talking about it um, later on as well. You can, you can either do that in the interview process or, or if you get further along and it looks like you, you will actually be hired, then you can, you can bring it up then as well. Some of my colleagues may disagree, but you, you, can, you, can, you can do it at any point. You can certainly make them aware of it um, during the interview process. What I can tell you from personal experience is that sometimes you might be afraid to because you might, that might rule you out as a candidate. Some companies will be afraid of that because immediately when they think of accommodations, they're gonna think dollar signs. Mm -hmm. So if you bring it up sort of after you've been hired, they're kind of on the hook at that point. So, um, so you can, but you can do it at any, at any point during the process whenever, whenever the candidate is comfortable. So if you wait until you get hired, mm -hmm. It would be okay then to tell them that you need accommodations, and whether sure. or not they give them to you is another story. Whether well, that's true, but and and that's where you know we, this will be a bigger discussion potentially later. But um, but but absolutely, you can do it once once you get hired. It's the same for somebody that that might be able-bodied, but then oh, I'm sorry, it may be the same for somebody that's able-bodied, but then something happens to them, they're employed, right? But now they need an accommodation, right. but they've been working at a company for. 10, 15, 20 years, but suddenly they need a, an accommodation to, to continue to work there. So yes, ab absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, thanks for coming today. Uh, and I wondered, as someone who works in the governor's office on these issues, <coughs> if you could specifically address um, individuals with disabilities and the specific issues So, uh, so I haven't worked in the governor's office in, in 
right. And you're in a, you're, it, right. So, but but I want to address what you're saying. So I'm working the governor's office in a year and a half. While I was there, what we did do for for all disabilities, uh, one of the comprehensive bills that we did pass was changing the language across all of our state statutes to be um, person first. And that was for any disability that was referenced within state statutes, which I'm quite certain uh, mentioned uh, a, a myriad of, of uh, invisible disabilities. Uh, as far as people with invisible disabilities advocating for themselves, I think the first thing that they would need to do is not be afraid to self-identify. That's a challenge in the disability community in general, is that they are afraid to self-identify when it comes to any sort of data gathering that's being done, any job, you know, any job that they're going for. They're, if they can avoid it, they might, they might not self-identify. But it's hard for you to advocate for yourself in any situation like that unless you, she's done hearing me talk this morning. Um, she gets this at home all uh, it, it's hard to advocate for yourself and, by extension, have others advocate for you unless they know the disability exists. So I think that's the biggest piece of advice I could give to those with, with invisible disabilities is let people know that you have it because it's invisible. So it, 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 that way they can help you. Thank you. You're welcome. One last question. Anybody? John, thank you very, very much. Thank you. My pleasure.